Hello everyone, welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our preparatory ground instruction for exercise 23, navigation. Uh, and if you've uh, noticed already, navigation is split up into three different uh, preparatory ground instructions. One's for pre-flight navigation, one is for in-flight navigation, and the third one is for diversions. The reason for that is because in your training, uh, these will be most likely separate flights, or in the case of pre-flight uh, uh, preparation, you will be uh, doing this kind of at a, at a different day anyway. And there's quite a bit of information involved as well. And in these uh, exercises, we're going to learn how to navigate uh, the aircraft from one point to another. This uh, obviously is important to know because I would imagine that after you get your pilot's license, you're not just going to want to remain in uh, one place in one airport because one of the great things about learning how to fly is once you know how to fly, you can easily go to places much farther than you could in a car in a much quicker amount of time. There is also a lot of overlap in this uh, preparatory ground instruction with what you have in your navigation ground school. So you can review that as well. Um, it's covered here again. The focus and the emphasis uh, during the preparatory ground instruction, though, is more on actual uh, what's going to be happening in the air and kind of real life uh, scenarios. So let's get started. Let's begin with discussing route choice. And so when you uh, decide to go on a cross country, you wanna go from one place to another, you're going to have to figure out the best route. And in most cases in, in Canada, uh, it's going to be a direct route, uh, but there might be uh, situations where it's not such a direct route. Uh, you may have to uh, factor in such variables such as the weather, uh, water, mountains, fuel availability. Let's say, uh, you want to do a flight Thunder Bay to Wawa, for example. So if you're in a multi-engine airplane, it's fine. You can go direct. But if you're flying a single-engine airplane, well, there's a, a big body of water in, in the middle there called Lake Superior. And so you might want to go north first towards Nipigon and, and Marathon before then heading south uh, east. Uh, similarly, if we uh, look at, let's say, uh, the mountains, here we are. Uh, we have this route here going direct while well, you have to cross these mountains at like eight or ten thousand feet that might be a bit higher than you're planning so probably the safer route is just uh go a bit lower but go um over the water where you uh, where you have a lot more options let's say the weather gets bad or things like that when planning a flight you want to be familiar with all uh, the weather information, the meteorological information. You're going to take a look at your METARs, TAFs, upper winds, and graphic area forecasts. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in this lesson. You should already know how to do that, uh, both in this part of your training as well. It's covered extensively in the meteorology section of uh, your ground school. But you, you have to be familiar with it uh, before you go uh, flying. So as we covered, in uh, the navigation portion of your ground school, let's discuss how to prepare our map. So we have uh, red circles. One, let's say we're going from Thunder Bay to uh, Shabanawan there, upper Shabanawan, um, the float base there. And then we're going to use Kakabeka Falls as our set heading point. So the formal part of our navigation is going to take place between Kekabeka Falls and our destination. So we draw a line uh, between those uh, two points and we mark, uh, I have 10 nautical mile markings. And then in the middle, typically I just make a diamond so that I know I'm, I'm at the halfway point. And then I just draw a, a line as well from my departure point to the set heading point. And then I do 10 degree drift line. So you learned all about this in your ground school. So I'm not, I'm not going to go over why we do all of this, uh, but that's uh, how we get started with preparing our map. Can have a, uh, f a navigation log or a VFR flight log, they're called. Uh, you can download one at freepilotgroundschool.ca or there's a ton of them online that different people have made up. But I personally like this one because it, it has everything that you need. Uh, there's a navigation uh, log portion, an en route log. You can fold the thing in half. You can print it double side. You have some notes. Uh, you can do a weight and balance using it. So it kind of works out uh, well. So for this flight, for example, We'll uh, just start here. So we fill out our flight log. And again, we learn this in our uh, 
ground school portion. So we are going from Kekebeka Falls to Shabandawan. So Kekebeka Falls is set heading point, remember? So we, we actually depart from Thunder Bay, but the the uh, the first leg is to our set heading point, Kekebeka Falls, which is 12 miles away. Our true track, our altitude's climbing, our true airspeed. Uh, so just think, where do we get that true airspeed from? So that's going to be, it's in the climb. So we're going to get that in the uh, time fuel distance climb time fuel distance uh, page in the performance section of the POH. And then to Shabana one, uh, we, we again measure our distance, our track, figure out our altitude, get our wind velocity. Wind velocity is from the uh, FD, the upper wind report. So here we go. This is where we get these numbers from. So hopefully uh, you're familiar with this part of your uh, POH. And then we do the rest of the calculations with our flight computer. Uh, so figuring out our true heading and our ground speed based on the wind and, and track, magnetic heading, and estimated time on route. So I already explained this in the ground school. A lot of you are probably saying, oh, why in the world do I need to do this? Uh, I, I have a GPS. And that is true. I mean, this is somewhat archaic, but there are a couple of reasons. First off is when you're learning to fly, you do things formally and, and based on what's called first principles. So this is kind of similar to the way an engineer might uh, learn their trade. They, they begin in university and they have to go and uh, calculate the, let's say, the, the moment of inertia um, of a, a section of a beam. And they do that using integrals. And uh, and then based on that, they can do it. But then when they're actually in the field, uh, they know the theory, but they don't do it like that. They just go and look in their tables and their engineering or, or their software will do it for them. But they still have a back, they still know how how the software came up with, with that. And so I encourage you to do that too, is that even, even if you are, uh, you, you have a GPS, you should really pay attention, know how to do this well, because one day you might, you might need to uh, you might need to do it. So you might be wondering, it's like, do you know, do you do it this way? And the truth is, no, I don't. But I don't just hop in an airplane and turn the GPS on. What I do, and what a lot of um, pilots do, is you you work off block times and block fuel burns. So I know that uh, let's just say my Cessna 150 will do an average of 80 knots. So in climb and cruise, it'll do 80 knots. And so then I just look at the uh, headwind component and add or subtract uh, to figure out my ground speed. And I know it's going to burn six gallons of fuel per hour on average uh, in the climb and the cruise. And then I just add 0.1 time on there kind of for the circuit. And it's always accurate to within about three minutes or so. So it might not be exactly like this, but I found it's very little difference. But at least I do something. I, I have an idea. I know what heading I'm going to fly. I know how much fuel I need, need to do. So I've done my due diligence and being responsible. But what I don't think is realistic is when, when you just hop in an airplane, turn the GPS on and hope it gets you there. Because invariably things happen, GPSs fail, equipment fails, and now all of a sudden you're like, I have no idea where I am. And I always have a VNC with me and I'm always navigating. I, and the other thing too is it's a challenge and it's fun. Anyway, after that kind of long rant, um, I'll just uh, get back to this lesson here. Uh, so we, we're going to look at our fuel required. We're going to, again, take a look at the performance section, both in the time fuel distance to climb and the cruise performance. And uh, here we go uh, with our fuel management. So if we take a look at uh, if we fill out this form, the fuel management part of the flight log, so starting taxi is 0.8 gallons. And you might be wondering, where is that? Well, that's note one on the uh, time fuel distance. It tells you to add uh, 0.8 gallons. And then I fill out the rest of the uh, fuel management uh, log with the uh, information that I got from the performance section. And you, if you're wondering how I got the fuel on board, so in this case, I have full fuel. So I go fuel required, which is the, well, I add everything up and that's that's the minimum I need, right? Now I know I'm gonna take off with full fuel. Uh, so then I put the fuel on board 22.5 and then the way I figure out my extras, I just subtract it. So I know I have 15.6 extra gallons of fuel available. 
Next thing I'm going to do is select some checkpoints. And as we dis uh, discussed in our uh, ground school, the point of the checkpoints is so that you can figure out what your ground speed is and revise your ETA. And so in this case, uh, th th this checkpoint here, it's over the road and then actually over the second road just before the lower Shabanawan Lake. And these kind of want to be obvious um, checkpoints. These aren't terribly good checkpoints, uh, like especially the first one, but there's not really anything that's more obvious. Uh, so that's why I selected that road. And actually, if you do this route, you'll find a number of roads. It's actually pretty easy to get confused, but I had to make this work for this PowerPoint um, because I, I needed a really short trip and that's just kind of the way it went. Uh, so you're going to uh, select these checkpoints and uh, part of the in-flight navigation, we'll, we'll discuss what we're actually doing at these checkpoints. But on the ground, we're going to fill out the, the white boxes, so the distance flown and the distance to, to go. And we're going to uh, figure out in flight uh, what our ground speed is and our revised ETA. Next, you're going to have to file a flight plan. So you need to do this whenever your flights are greater than 25 nautical miles. You can also do a flight itinerary with a responsible person. But uh, for this exercise, we'll just uh, say we're just going to file a flight plan with uh, Nav Canada. So go on plan.navcanada.ca. You can file a flight plan online there, or you can do it the old-fashioned way: give them a phone call on one eight six six WX Brief. Here's how uh, these flight plans look like. Uh, this is kind of the old form. You used to kind of used to fill out this form and then fax it in or something like that and then for some reason there's you know arrows with equal signs i'm not exactly sure it's probably some sort of recognition archaic recognition software that put it automatically into the uh, computer but it's pretty basic to figure out you have your aircraft identification your vfr your type equipment departure uh, time cruising speed and then your route so here is uh uh, something that you do need to know, which is not obvious in the route, is how do you specify if you're stopping somewhere? And the way to do that is in brackets, put the time that you're stopping. So here we are at Shabanawan Lake uh, for 45 minutes. And then we're heading back to Thunder Bay. And you, again, this question will come up on both your flight test and your written test. What do you put in for your total time on route. So that's the total time, including stops, the flight time plus stops. So by the time you get back. So when you depart, air traffic control will mark down your departure time. Uh, when you add on that number in your total EET, estimated on route time, you add that on, well, that is the time uh, that you are expected to land. And then if you're not there an hour after, they're going to start uh, looking for you. Uh, the one thing they ask you to do now too is in the remarks, they want your cell phone number. Yeah, because invariably people forget to close their flight plans and then they want a cell phone they can call you and be like hey before we send the search and rescue airplanes for you we're just making sure that you're okay then we're going to do our uh, weight and balance so again you learn this in your uh, ground school and to do the weight and balance we're going to look at our empty weight and moment we're going to get that from our weight and balance documents add up all the weights look at the loading graph for uh, the moment and add that all up. And then where they meet, you look at the uh, moment envelope and we can tell that we are in range. With regard to aircraft serviceability, uh, you're going to look at your journey logbook, ensure that the aircraft maintenance is up to date. So look at when the last 50 hour inspection was. That's kind of the easiest one to do and make sure that you're not past that 50 hours. There's also out of phase items. You can find those in CAR 625 Appendix C. Or if you're really eager, ask your uh, director of maintenance at your flying school or wherever you are for the approved maintenance schedule. And then there's all sorts of different items in there that you can spend your time. But that's probably not really your responsibility and and kind of beyond what you need to do but it is somewhat interesting to just know how the flying school uh, tracks their maintenance you can look at their maintenance tracker and then every day they they enter in the flying time and then it will tell them uh, for example when when they need to fix the night or replace the part or inspect a part or whatever that uh, calls for uh, you also want to take a look at uh, defects take a look through the the logbook any sort of uh, defect 
has to be addressed somehow. It doesn't need to be fixed necessarily if it's not an error worthiness item, but uh, it, it has to be addressed. So somebody might write in their navigation light burned out and then the aircraft maintenance engineer would write either that it's been fixed or I would write uh, nav light deferred uh, flight restricted to day VFR only, uh, which is okay. If you have a light burnt out, you can still fly the airplane. You just can't fly it at night. So uh, you just, you what you don't want to see is something that says nav light burnt out and then people just kept flying the airplane. It means that nobody actually assessed the airworthiness of this aircraft. So here's an example of a maintenance uh, log, a maintenance release, so that you, you can see here, well, they what did they have to do here? So they had to do oh, 100 hour inspection completed as per CAR, uh, 625 appendix uh, B and C. This is actually, technically it's incorrect. Uh, if you're doing uh, CAR 625 appendix B and C, it applies to annual inspections. 100 hour inspections are something that a commercial operator would do. So you would complete that as per the manufacturer's recommendation, but I'm just being, uh, I don't know, a stickler. But anyway, here's all the things that they did. Uh, and again, like I mentioned earlier in, in the PGI, this is a good log entry. So they did this inspection. Look at all the little things that they found. Uh, they replaced some things. Oh, they, the Lord mounts down here. Those are the vibration dampeners. Oh, they 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 inspect those and, and replace them because they needed. And and obviously this AME actually did a real inspection and 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 kind of continuously aimed to continuously improve this airplane. Just kind of did some work on it. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like. And you can tell here. Uh, when, when this was done, this 100 hour inspection, here was the time done. Okay, and let's say this was the log entry. So you couldn't fly this airplane beyond, let's say 6,247.5, uh, something that, you'd, uh, that you would look at. And, uh, and then there are no, uh, un, at least on this page anyway, there's no defects that are un, uh, unrecorded or, or, uh, are, or unrectified. Okay, let's talk about the flight test standards. So this exercise is for private pilot and commercial pilots only. So if you're in a rec flight test, uh, you're not expected to do this. But what will happen is the examiner, either the day of the test or the day before, will say, okay, I want you to do, here, here's the scenario. I want you to do a flight from here to here. And uh, and I have, it's me, I'm uh, 200 pounds, let's say, and I have 20 pounds of uh, baggage. And so you're going to select a route and uh, most likely it's going to be direct. The examiner is going to ask you to open your map and identify different types of airspace on that map, obstruction. Just make sure that you know how to read this map on the ground. You're going to check the weather and explain the weather to the uh, examiner. Uh, you are going to uh, figure out what runways you're going to use and make some uh, contingency plans. You're going to uh, select appropriate cruising altitudes based on what the, the cloud level is at, do your nav logs, complete a flight plan, and do a weight and balance uh, calculation. I, uh, there's, a, there's a tip that I'd like to pass on to you for how to do this effectively, is you're going to calculate all of these things, prepare all these documents, and then when you walk into the flight test, you want to be really organized. And what I always explain to students is don't wait for the examiner to kind of get all the information from you. Just walk in and say, after you kind of do your pleasantries, say, I plan the flight that you assigned me. Would you like me to brief you on the flight? And most likely the examiner will say like, yes. And then you just start talking and talk about this flight until the examiner tells you to stop. And that's actually a, a pretty good um, strategy for any oral exam. You just keep talking and talking and talking until they get fed up with you. And and that way they know that you've planned this stuff. Everything's organized. You're going to tell them what you did. You're going to explain why you did it. And then, it, and then it's up to them. They can stop you and ask any questions. Um, but that's a far more effective way to do an oral exam than just walking in, being quiet. The examiner doesn't know if you know what you're talking about and they have to ask and, and get every little bit of information from you. So that's what I tell to do my students and I encourage you, uh, it's just, a, it's a good way uh, to do things and then you could you can continue on and say, okay, would you like to look at the journey logbook and the documents? And before you know it, you know, half an hour has gone, you haven't stopped talking and the examiner's like, okay, fine. You know what you're talking about, let's go fly.
So, so that concludes this lesson on pre-flight preparation. Again, uh, if you want more information about it, it's covered in a lot more depth in your ground school. So take a look uh, there and uh, we'll see you in our next lesson on uh, the in-flight navigation.